Hello and welcome to South Carolina's installment of Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture. I'm your host, Reggie Hall. There are a number of holidays throughout the year when we recognize the work of patriots. The image that we conjure up most when we do that is of those men and women who are in the armed forces, and rightfully so. They work hard to put themselves in harm's way to protect our freedoms in this country, but they also work around the world to improve human relationships and peace. We'll tell you about one such mission that's going on in Afghanistan as a group of South Carolina soldiers are there to harvest peace through agriculture. That and more is coming up as Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture from South Carolina continues. Please stay tuned. Years ago, when my Aunt Joan suffered a stroke, it was devastating for all of us. And although it didn't take her life, it took something so much more important to her. It took her independence. I don't ever want another family to have to go through that. The thing is, with what we can do today, a stroke doesn't have to happen. 80% of strokes can be prevented when the risk is detected early and then treated by a doctor. That's why many doctors recommend lifeline screening. We use sonograms to look inside your arteries because that's where the plaque that causes most strokes builds up. You usually can't see it or feel it, and a routine physical won't usually check for it. To schedule a Lifeline screening near you, call 888-787-2873. We screen the carotid arteries, the abdominal aorta, and the peripheral arteries. It's easy, completely painless, and every screening is reviewed by a board-certified physician. Lifeline screening offers packages of tests for just $135. Call 888-787-2873. If a screening could prevent a stroke, why wouldn't you do it? Hello and welcome back to South Carolina's installment of Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture. I'm Reggie Hall. More times than not, when we think of patriot, we conjure up images of the men and women in the armed forces, as well we should. But if we take the word in a broader sense, we can also think of the many men and women who have served our country in the farm fields toiling night and day to keep our country and much of the world fed, clothed, and sheltered. A patriot is one who loves, supports, and defends his or her country and its interests with devotion. On the fields of battle, our soldiers thrust swords to defend our freedoms. Men and women of the farm guide plowshares to satiate our appetites. No army, no matter how large or powerful, is successful without adequate food, clothing, or shelter. At the time our country was founded, many military leaders and soldiers had their roots firmly planted in farming, just like South Carolina's own swamp fox, Francis Marion. The story of agriculture is essential to understanding the rich history and culture of the great Palmetto State, as well as the nation. As one of the original colonies, South Carolina was founded on a deep agricultural base. Native Americans sustained themselves through agriculture and later taught European settlers how to farm. Today, agribusiness, including farms and forestry, is South Carolina's largest business sector. South Carolina has witnessed dramatic changes and growth experienced by agriculture throughout history. Always striving to find the most efficient and effective ways to work, farmers have evolved from using primitive tools in farming practices to the use of computerized equipment, global positioning systems, and satellite technology. Each innovation built upon the last allows farmers and ranchers to produce more food on fewer acres than ever before. Today, each individual South Carolina farmer produces enough food and fiber to sustain more than 150 people worldwide. In 1960, that number was only 26 people per farmer. Valuable for much more than just their production, farmers are important conservationists as they help protect and preserve the environment using bioengineered seeds, high-tech equipment, and they provide natural habitats for wildlife. Farmers' concern for the environment extends to health and well-being of their own animals as they take steps to ensure their animals receive the best possible care in order to provide healthy food for consumers 
including their own families. We'll look back at an earlier time of farming in South Carolina when Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture continues. Hello and welcome back to South Carolina's installment of Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture. I'm your host, Reggie Hall. We're talking about patriots of agriculture. You know, farming is a strong component in our nation's evolution, and it's a thread that binds the original colonies together, including South Carolina. As farming evolved in South Carolina and farmers implemented lessons learned from Native Americans, a number of tools were invented and implemented to make work on the farm more efficient and valuable. After destruction of land and property caused by the Revolutionary War, some South Carolina farmers tried growing new crops and farming practices. Most lost their crops and tools during that war. Rice planters began to switch from growing rice in swamps to a more sophisticated method of damming coastal rivers for rice production. Farmers of all types of agriculture suffered because Britain and its colonies in the West Indies were no longer markets for their goods. Indigo production became less profitable and farmers looked for new crops to grow, such as cotton. Eli Whitney's cotton gin provided the answer for most planters. This invention, still used in a more modern form today, quickly and easily removed seeds from short staple cotton. Eventually, cotton became king in South Carolina and across the Southeast. Farmers were so interested in making money from cotton that they didn't take care of the land. When it became too poor to produce cotton, they simply cut down more trees and planted more cotton. Corn was another early staple in our country, and it remains vital today not only as feed for humans and livestock, but also as a key ingredient in fuel, like ethanol, and a number of other products, including many plastics. At the turn of the 20th century, patriots of agriculture used horses or mules to pull manual plows or other tillage implements. As corn grew in popularity, the land had to be cultivated. Once the crop matured and the corn dried, the ear was removed from the stalk by hand, unless you were fortunate enough to have a snapper. That's a machine with two rollers made to break or snap corn ears from the stalks. A tractor pulled the machine through the field as it also furnished power to turn the snapping rollers, the elevators, and the fans. The wagon behind the snapper collected ears for transport to storage. Removing the shuck from the ear was also done by hand or machine a process called shucking before the ears were shelled. A corn sheller saved the farm family time and energy. Corn cobs were saved to fuel the family fireplace and the shucks were most likely fed to the mules. Frugal times required people to live by the saying, waste not, want not. To make the most out of corn for livestock, dried kernels were cracked. The small pieces of cracked corn were then fed to the farm's chickens, which supplied eggs and fryer chickens for the dinner table. Some machines were run by hit-and-miss engines, an engineering design of great value until they were replaced by more efficient models. Corn grits and corn meal were staples of the family kitchen. The grits were cooked in many different ways, and the corn meal was used in bread-like foods, hoe cakes, and cornbread. The 1920s machine which ground corn into grits and meal was affordable for large farms to own, which saved farmers a trip to the community grist mill to have their corn ground. Farming remained human and animal labor intensive. Over time, as farms became more specialized and volumes increased, machines were developed to increase productivity and output. That led to a decrease for labor needed to produce commodities like small grains, wheat, oats. Hand harvesting small grains included the use of a curved cutting blade with a handle. The farmer used one hand, normally his right, to cut the grain, while his other hand was used to collect or cradle the cut stalks. Later, a cradle was developed so the farmer could use two hands in a sweeping or swinging motion to collect the cut stalks. Stalks of grain were bundled together as shocks, 
so they could be left in the field to dry. Small grains were planted in the late fall or early winter in the southeast. They are normally not cultivated and instead had to be harvested by cutting the plant and removing the grain or seed heads from the top of the plant. As with corn, the cutting and removal could have been done with hand labor, which was very slow and hard work, or with the help of machines. Dedicated to working smarter and not harder, patriots of agriculture invented modern machines in the early 20th century to improve efficiency on the farm, like this machine pulled by two mules to harvest the grain stalks. It cut the grain and gathered it into bundles. This machine later improved by adding a mechanism that tied the shocks with string, which made it easier and sturdier to stack in the field. Most small farms didn't have their own threshers. Most small grain producing areas had one farmer who owned the thresher and the tractor to power it. This person often bartered or traded his services of threshing small grain in exchange for a toll or a part of the grain. In 1918, it was not uncommon for a thresher to be powered by a 45 horsepower steam engine tractor. Steam engines were fueled by wood or coal that burned in a firebox. The fire heated the water until it steamed under pressure, which drove the machine. Until baling machines were developed, all hay had to be handled loose with a pitchfork. It was stacked, loose in the field in summer, and hauled to hungry livestock in winter. That practice caused a lot of hay to ruin or decay. Later, the baler allowed the farmer to compress the hay and protect it from the weather. It was a great help, but it still required a lot of work. The hay or straw had to be hand-fed in the machine for baling. Wooden blocks were placed between the bales. The bales were held together by a wire insert, which was tied by hand. While most farms were operated by menfolk, we cannot overlook the contributions of women on the farm. They managed the household, cooked, cleaned, and helped with routine farm chores and activities, including quilt making. Blankets were expensive and money was hard to come by. Quilts were made from scrap cloth with a great deal of craftsmanship and labor. Rural communities had quilting gatherings or parties where the farm wives gathered and pooled their efforts to sew together various pieces of cloth. Feed and fertilizer sacks were also used as material for the precious quilts. Farm wives often accompanied their husbands to the feed store so they could pick out the feed sack print designs that best suit their fancy for quilt making. Good quilts took weeks of patient work and skill. Well-made quilts would surely become family heirlooms and collector's items. In addition to dedication, hard work, and loyalty to the cause, patriots are also industrious and ingenious. Those traits become obvious at the local blacksmith shop, a machine shop where tools were made and repaired, and the transportation needs of the farm were supported. Many farms had their own shop worker, called a blackie or blacksmith. A hot fire is essential for blacksmithing. Bellows inhaled air and forced it out on the coals to increase the heat of the fire in the forge. The blacksmith made a number of different items out of the metal for the farm and farm home. Everything from hinges to horseshoes was crafted. The blacksmith would occasionally enlist the help of other men on the farm to help with large projects, like preparing a metal rim for a wooden wagon or buggy wheel. The rim was heated in a hot fire which caused it to expand so it could fit over the wooden wheel. As the rim cooled, it shrank, which kept it tight on the wheel. Wagon wheels were mostly made from oak or hickory wood, so they would be strong and tough enough to survive the rough dirt roads and paths of the time. When Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture continues, we'll leave the early 20th century and travel to a more modern era of agriculture in South Carolina. Thanks for staying with us for South Carolina's installment of Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture. I'm your host, Reggie Hall. We've been talking about patriots of agriculture, focusing on the dedicated, loyal, and committed men and women of the farm who help feed, clothe, and shelter the rest of the world. 
In a moment, we'll tell you about a unique team of soldiers on their way from South Carolina to Afghanistan to help the native people there grab a better understanding of knowledge and expertise of farming practices. In many technological ways, farmers in Afghanistan are where farmers in America were back at the turn of the 19th and 20th century. Our team is there to help them improve that and catch up with modern times. Here in South Carolina, the use of technology on the farm really took off after World War II. Farmers switched from mules and plows to tractors and other farm machinery. Farm machinery improved agriculture and allowed farmers to cultivate larger farms and grow more crops. As technology replaced the need for farm labor, many people transitioned from on-farm labor to work on farm-related industries like processing, packing, selling agricultural products, producing farm machinery used on farms, and researching better ways to produce food or conserve soil, water, and other natural resources. Today, South Carolina farmers grow a wide variety of crops. Though some still grow cotton, they also produce soybeans, peanuts, peaches, corn, tobacco, sweet potatoes, tea, fish, poultry, milk, meat, eggs, vegetables, and a number of other farm products. Farmers also grow timber and tree products, which are an important contribution to South Carolina's agriculture and its natural beauty. Innovations in technology like global positioning systems, or GPS, and geographical information systems, or GIS, help farmers with farm planning, field mapping, soil sampling, tractor guidance, crop scouting, and yield mapping, processes known as precision agriculture. South Carolina farmers face many challenges in the 21st century. Farmers have to continue to work hard, be creative, and think about the future to stay in business, such as by growing new varieties or organic food, or by delivering food through community-supported agriculture partnerships, or by operating roadside stands or orchards where people pick their own food. Despite the challenges, farmers, young and old, continue to work hard and succeed. Regardless of the type of agriculture they practice, these patriots of agriculture remain an important part of South Carolina today, and agriculture continues to be a strong and vital thread in the fabric of the Palmetto State's history. And farmers are making a difference halfway across the world as South Carolinians work with Afghan farmers to help them learn modern farming practices. Stay tuned as Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture continues. Hello and welcome back to South Carolina's installment of Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture. I'm Reggie Hall. We've been talking about patriots of agriculture, highlighting the men and women of the farm as they use their ingenuity, dedication, and loyalty, as well as modern farming practices to help feed, clothe, and shelter the rest of the world. Now it's time to look at a different type of patriot, the farmer soldier, and see what an impact they're making halfway across the world. Like those in other states, South Carolina's Army National Guard is comprised of citizen soldiers, in this case, full-time farmers who dedicate their lives to the land at home, and part-time soldiers who take to the battlefield in times of war. Military agribusiness units have been working in Afghanistan since 2008. They work to improve irrigation and water management for farmers who lack modern vehicles and traditions. Now, a team of about four dozen soldiers is on its way to Afghanistan to continue the mission to spread peace through farming. Once a major exporter of dried fruits, nuts, and pomegranates, Afghanistan is now known mainly for growing poppies for the opium trade. The Agribusiness Deployment Team, or ADT, hopes to show the native people how they can be players in the world agribusiness market and return more on their investment than is currently being made by the local people working the poppy fields. U.S. government officials say grapes can be trellised to turn about 10 times the profit that can be made with poppy. 
Corn and wheat can be grown together to make ten times the profit over poppy production. But they add, you've got to show them how and you have to get the water there at the right time, at the right place, with the right seed and the right fertilizer. That's where the ADT unit can help, by sharing technology to a region that has lost much of its generational knowledge through nearly four decades of war. Surrounded by family, friends, and well-wishers, ADT commander in South Carolina, Colonel Glenn Skosky, said the unit is trained and ready for the mission. Uh, we've been together for about six months, brought, brought them together from all around the, the state. I can't express enough about the talent in this group. I am humbled and I'm honored to work with them. They are a great group and we're ready to go. We have a motto that says, plant success, harvest freedom. These individuals over to my left will plant success and they will harvest freedom. Major General Robert Livingston, Jr., South Carolina's Adjutant General, said the ADT unit is heading to Afghanistan at a particularly difficult time. The unit looks forward to bringing hope and promise to the people of the Helmand and Kanadar provinces, currently two of the most turbulent spots in that country. This mission is, is extremely critical. The problem in Afghanistan is uh, you have destitute people that uh, have been uh, devastated by over 30 years of war, centuries of unrest, and uh, they just want something different. They want something better. Yeah, it took a couple, couple hundred thousand dollars and started an experimental station and started growing crops that are indigenous to Afghanistan but under advanced techniques. And they demonstrated those capabilities and an amazing thing happened. Uh, peace broke out for about a 25 mile radius around that experimental station. Farmers pulled the guns off the shelf and they told the Taliban, get out of town, these guys and gals are helping us. They're not out killing people, but they're helping us have a better life. And that is the key to getting out of Afghanistan. And so that's what, how the agricultural team movement got started, was that little experimental station over in Shindam. And this will be our second agricultural team we'll send. They're going in a very critical area, uh, going down to Helmand province, Kandahar province. Y'all probably heard those areas. Uh, very, very critical, the home of the Taliban, and also the area that has been the most devastated by the Taliban. The ADT unit from South Carolina mainly consists of farmers and security personnel. There are several women farm soldiers on the team to help communicate with Afghan farm wives and other women, as the local culture prohibits men from engaging women in conversation. The team will be in Afghanistan for 12 months once they reach their destinations. We should also mention that the South Carolina ADT team is just one of many teams from the National Guard that have been in Afghanistan, but reports that have come back from those people say the Afghan people are very receptive and appreciative to the knowledge, experience, and expertise we've been able to show them so they can catch up to modern times in agriculture. We hope you've gained a greater perspective and an understanding of patriots of agriculture in this show. To learn more about that or other topics that we've covered on this RFD channel, we invite you to log on to our website, scfb.org. Click on video in the upper right-hand corner. If you're on Facebook, please log on to South Carolina Farm Bureau Federation and like us. We'd love to have you as part of our community. You can also follow us on Twitter if you'd like. But for now, that's all the time we have for this installment from South Carolina of Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.